thank you very much for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here. Um, so this talk is going to be about um, knowledge of logic and in particular knowledge of basic logical principles such as uh, modus ponens um, and the applicability in reasoning. Okay, so um, oh, where is this thing? Oh, I'll do that. Okay, so that sort of I'm going to distinguish between two views of say knowing modus ponens. Um, one says that uh, knowledge of modus ponens is propositional, it's a bit of propositional knowledge, uh, is knowing that P together with P, uh, and, uh, to, together with if P then Q entails Q, call that logical cognitivism. And uh, the contrast is with logical non-cognitivism that says that knowledge of basic logical principles is non-propositional or maybe it's not uh, really a type of knowledge. And just, so I, t I take that, I take it that uh, logical cognitivism is going to be an instance of what uh, Marcos called representationalist views of these things. I'm not sure, but uh, uh, it is going to be uh, um, the same kind of view. Okay, so um, I want to discuss a threat to logical cognitivism that I label uh, the general to particular circularity threat. Um, and the thought is um, simple. Uh, 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 people think, oh, the argument is that, um, look, logical principles are general principles uh, or applications of these principles in reasoning are to particular instances. Um, it seems that uh, whenever we want to reason with these particular instances, instances, we have to deduce that they are instances of general uh, principles and so we can't really reason with instances uh, without operating some prior reasoning and that seems to suggest that we can't uh, reason at all. I'm going to uh, look at two versions of this uh, threat um, and I explain as I go along why they are threats or taken to be threats to logical cognitivism. The first one uh, is um, discussed by Romina Padro is called, the, or she calls it the Carol Kripke adoption problem. And the second one uh, is discussed by Bogosian and he calls it Carolian circularity. Uh, just a few words about the labels here. So they are both Carolian types of threats. Uh, they are, you can think of them as instances of Lewis Carroll's regress. Um, and they both suggest that we cannot, in fact, uh, um, perform very simple deductive inferences. Deductive reasoning is impossible. Um, just on the Carol Kripke adoption problem, so um, uh, I'm going to use, so Romina Padro is in charge of the Kripke archive um, at uh, CUNY and uh, she's, dis she's describing this problem that Kripke has discussed in some lectures uh, as uh, a kind of current problem for circularity. So that's why it's called the Carol Kripke problem as described by Romina Padro, because <laughs> Kripke doesn't <laughs> publish anything. She publishes her his stuff. Anyway, it's complicated. But, uh, but so I'll just refer to uh, the adoption problem uh, and, and what she says about it. But this is why it's uh, got this uh, complicated label. Okay, so what I want to do in the talk, I want to consider these two um, versions of the threat uh, and uh, tell you why actually the, this threat can be uh, diffused and there isn't really a, a problem there. Okay, uh, so first, so you have a handout, you don't really need the handout, it's just, you know, it's nice to hold something I suppose. Or, um, okay, so the first is um, um, the adoption problem, so here's how she describes it. Uh, certain basic logical principles cannot be adopted because if a subject already infers in accordance with them, no adoption is needed. And if the subject does not infer in accordance to them, uh, no adoption uh, is possible. And uh, what she argues is that it's impossible to adopt them, so, you know, um, uh, we have to somehow think that uh, uh, we come equipped with uh, these uh, principles, we never get to adopt them. Okay, so the way she describes uh, adoption is a two-stage process. 
first we learn general rules or general principles of inference, such as what is ponens, and then we apply these uh, um, principles in uh, reasoning. Uh, and she argues that adoption so construed uh, leads to a kind of vicious circularity. Um, so she focuses on uh, the case of universal sensation. So I'm going to start with that case uh, and then uh, I will apply it to uh, the case of more disponents so that you have a, a contrast between the two cases. So um, universal instantiation um, is the principle uh, that you know, uh, tells you that um, um, that governs you know, the uh, elimination of the universal quantifier and tells you that if everything whatsoever satisfies a given condition, then uh, uh, any particular object uh, satisfies it too. So the way she sets it up is as follows. So suppose that you believe that everything is extended. Um, and suppose that um, you complete phase one of adoption, so you learn the general principle. I, I um, uh, tell you, look, this is, you know, uh, valid principle or uh, val valid uh, rule uh, of logic. Um, so suppose you conf complete this first phase of adoption and then suppose I ask you, well, do you think this object is extended? So for instance, do you think, suppose we conjectured the existence of an atom or a very small particle which we call A. So um, I ask you, do you think A is extended? And there she thinks she cannot answer the question. Uh, the reason uh, is this, is that um, to reason from your belief that everything is extended to this particular, being, particular object being extended, you would have to instantiate in two ways. Um, you would have um, to instantiate uh, that this particular inference that goes from everything is extended to A is extended is um, an instance of universal sensation, and then you would also have to reason from everything is extended to uh, atom A is extended. Um, so prior to applying uh, the rule you've just learned to your particular reasoning from everything is extended to atom A is extended, you already have to perform uh, a bit of reasoning using universal instantiation. So given that the first bit of reasoning was meant to be your completion of adopting universal instantiation, you cannot adopt it uh, because it's required for that very adoption. So you cannot adopt uh, universal instantiation. Okay, so just to put it schematically, I've put that on the handout. Um, uh, so there are two instances of universal instantiation in place here, the one that, you know, the particular inference you want to make, and the second one which is going from the general principle to the very instance you're interested in. So you start with your initial belief, you adopt, you complete phase one of adoption, so, oh, I guess I have a... Okay, <laughs> yeah, uh, well, that's not very useful, anyway. Um, so you complete phase one of adoption, ask you, well, you know, then can you, you know, go to your conclusion, say, oh no, hold on, uh, I would need to have this, uh, to perform this application of universal instantiation prior. I can't do that because I haven't yet adopted fully uh, universal instantiation. And so um, uh, uh, I can never reach the step three of that little inference, so I can't uh, go to uh, uh, the conclusion uh, I was meant to go to. And notice also that if I were to ever, per impossible if you wish, be able to complete that step, I would also have had to uh, uh, have uh, adopted the disponents. Okay, so that's the problem. Uh, let me just um, apply it to the disponents just for so that you have a contrasting case. So the disponents is the principle up there. This is an instance of modus ponens. Um, so suppose that uh, you come to believe the uh, premises of that instance, that, if, uh, that it is day then, and if it is day, it is light. Then you complete the phase one of adoption of modus ponens. You learn the general principle. I ask you, is it light then? Um, it seems that, well, before you can answer that question, you would have to recognize that that instance is an instance of this general principle of modus ponens. You have to use uh, universal instantiation applied to modus ponens. I call it UIMP. 
it's this rule. Um, but you, you know, if you haven't been able to adopt universal, universal instantiation, as I just told you, you can't. I mean, she tells you that you can't. Uh, then you're going to be stuck again. Okay, and so um, uh, you can't um, adopt modus ponens either, and uh, you can't adopt any uh, basic logical principle. Okay, mm. so. Yeah, the upshot is um, in, con uh, in connection with the modus ponens is that you would have to have adopted uh, universal instantiation in order to adopt uh, modus ponens. Notice that in the ad adoption of modus ponens, um, we have an application of modus ponens itself. Supposing you had reached this step here, you would need to have an application of modus ponens as well here, but that application would be relatively unproblematic uh, because adoption in phase two requires you to apply the very principle uh, you're adopting to a specific instance of reasoning, and that's exactly what is going on here. So if you were able to arrive here, then you would be uh, consistent with adopting modus ponens, that you would apply modus ponens here at this stage in your reasoning. Okay, so this is just to stress that the key problem here is that uh, we need universal instantiation in order for us to be, to be able to apply any uh, logical rule uh, in our reasoning. If we were able to uh, uh, um, use, modus, uh, use universal instantiation, then in principle we could apply all the, uh, we could uh, adopt all the other principles. So the problem is really with universal instantiation. Okay, so Padro concludes from this that we should reject cognitivism because she thinks cognitivism has to be committed to that kind of view that first you adopt these general principles and then you apply them uh, in your reasoning. Uh, she's not very committed <coughs> to an alternative view, she toys with the idea of non-propositional knowing how or skills, uh, where you don't really adopt, uh, uh, perhaps, I, I, I don't know the details, but you don't really adopt uh, uh, general principles as such, or even that, you know, there isn't really, uh, we shouldn't really talk about knowledge of these principles, you know, maybe there are kinds of um, processes resulting from uh, mechanisms that uh, cannot really count as knowledge. But anyway, she, she definitely thinks that we can't be uh, cognitivists. Okay, so that's for the uh, first version of the threat. Uh, now the second version is what Bogosian calls uh, Carolian circularity. Mm. Okay, I'm going to mention two, two versions of um, the way he thinks about it, or two ways in, in which he thinks about it. So, uh, in his paper, Blind Reasoning, um, he discusses Carian circularity in the context of arguing against a view which he calls simple inferential internalism. Um, so actually that's a um, foundationist view uh, about what it is to know a logical principle. It's called unhappily uh, inferentialism, inferential internalism because um, uh, it is, you know, knowledge about uh, performing inferences, but uh, it is a foundationist view. Uh, and um, the sample view he considers there is Bonjour's uh, rational insight view, um, according to whom um, we can apprehend facts of validity uh, directly, immediately, so without uh, uh, performing any inference. Okay, so um, the view goes like this, uh, S is justified in believing the conclusion of a valid argument on the basis of its premises only if condition C obtains uh, and uh, C says S is able to know by reflection alone, that's the rational insight bit, that S's premises provide S with good reason for believing uh, the conclusion. Okay, so according to him, this view is uh, open to a fatal circularity threat. 
Um, I'm going to summarize it, but I've given you the quote, a long quote on the page one of the hand that where, I, I don't want to read a long quote, but uh, where he states um, the, you know, uh, the current circularity threat. But let me schematize it uh, as follows. So what he's saying basically, look, you know, suppose we have this rational, ins ooh, sorry, I'm, I should not touch, touch this, sorry. <laughs> suppose we have this um, rational inside view, so maybe that gives you knowledge of this general pattern, this general principle of interest for disponents. Um, so maybe you know that directly, you know, without performing any kind of inference. Uh, but then, you know, the matter arises of applying that bit of knowledge in your reasoning. Uh, how can you do that? Okay. Um, and then you have an argument that I, you know, uh, take to be structurally similar to the one we uh, saw in the adoption case. Uh, so you know modus ponens through rational insight. Uh, then you consider the instance I, I talked about earlier. Uh, it is light. Uh, if it, it is day, if it is day, it is light. Therefore, uh, it is light. Um, so you think, well, you, know, so you assume that if that's going to be an instance of modus ponens, then it's going to be valid. Um, then you have to <laughs> recognize this as an instance of more exponents, you know. So the problem is, it would seem you need to reason from, you know, this general case to this particular one. And it seems that to do it so, you would have to use the very same uh, instance of universal instantiation considered earlier uh, to recognize, you know, this bit of uh, reasoning as an instance of modus ponens, and then from this, uh, using modus ponens, you could uh, 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 conclude that the argument is valid. Uh, and so the problem is that prior to be able to use re uh, modus ponens in your reasoning, you would have to, you know, apply uh, another rule, uh, and so uh, your um, reasoning with modus ponens, you know, presupposes another bit of reasoning and then you would have to see you know why this prior bit of reasoning is relevant to your reasoning etc. So his conclusion is that reasoning with modus ponens is impossible uh, because to reason from your premises to your conclusion you have to pr go through arguments uh, such as 9 to 12 and that requires using modus ponens and modus ponens. Okay and so it's not very clear by the upshot of that but uh, it clearly wants to reject, you know, uh, the kind of uh, cognitivism uh, that might be embodied in a, a rational insight uh, view. Uh, let me just quickly um, mention the second uh, way he talks about it. Um, uh, and um, that's in connection actually with his taking condition. So I thought I'd mention it because uh, I know some of you are interested in it. Um, Okay, so in what is inference, his target uh, is what he calls the in, it's, it's an internalist view of uh, uh, knowing with the supporters, uh, the intentional view of rule following, whereby we, explici we explicitly represent uh, principles such as modus ponens uh, as beliefs or bits of propositional knowledge. And he thinks that this view has uh, an inference problem. Um, and I've given you a quote on page two, if you want to uh, see exactly what it says, but it seems to be essentially that stated uh, in the uh, case of Carolian circularity, except that uh, the first step would not be motivated by rational insight. Um, you know, we have to start with this general uh, principle because uh, we have to meet another kind of requirement, which is that um, uh, you know, we, we follow, we are guided by rules when we uh, reason uh, deductively, okay? Um, so essentially, uh, it would be justified by the, the sort of taking condition. I'm not going to read it again. Um, but so here, uh, uh, it seems that um, if you, you had that kind of, exp you know, intentional view of rule following, uh, which is motivated this time by the t something like the taking condition, then you would have uh, 
uh, a problem of circularity of the same type. And what it suggests in the paper, insofar as I understand it, um, is that we take uh, rule following as a kind of sui generis primitive. So we definitely want to reject cognitive We don't have modus ponens beliefs, but um, he wants to say that uh, you know it's not it's not either just a you know pure dispositional state or just a skill or what have you, but this kind of sui generis cognitive pressure state that display that displays enough intentionality. Uh, so as to do justice uh, to the uh, taking condition. Okay. Um, okay. So this is the second um, uh, threat of circularity. So I take it they are uh, very similar. Okay. So uh, they are both uh, drawing on this problem that we need to apply general principles in our reasoning with instances. Uh, um, and, um, and that is going to presuppose reasoning from uh, the general principle to the instances, uh, and that's uh, going to crucially involve an application of universal instantiation. And so uh, they both suggest that, you know, on a view whereby knowing a, a principle starts with you having, uh, you know, a bit of propositional knowledge of that principle or you know, explicit representations of that principle, then uh, you'll have uh, uh, this problem that you can't uh, ever reason from any premise to any conclusion. Okay, so what I want to do now um, is uh, answer this threat. Um, so what I want to do is two things. First, um, I want to reject that we need an application of universal instantiation whenever we want to use a general principle in our reasoning. And, I, and to, do, to do so, I'm going to contrast uh, the principle of uh, universal instantiation from another kind of transition that I call substitution. I mean, no, it's not me who, I mean, that is called substitution. And then I'll, I'll, I'll try to uh, convince you that you can address uh, the, the threat this way. And then if I have the time, I'd like to further explore um, this presupposition that we need uh, to use, to apply general principles uh, in our uh, reasoning with instances. And I guess that's going to go back to the exchange between Declin and Anasara uh, earlier, or, uh, but you, we can discuss it after. Okay, so first, um, the contrast between universal instantiation and substitution. Um, I need to make a very substantive assumption at this point. Uh, I'm going to take universal instantiation and modus ponens to be schemas as containing schematic uh, letters. Okay. Um, uh, as you'll see, that's required for, for what follows. Um, so, just to give you a bit on what schemas are, so schematic letters, strictly speaking, don't really have contents. Uh, a schema is just some, a kind of placeholder for a collection of arguments, if you wish. Um, there are various ways of thinking about schema. So, one is this notion of, you know, uh, a placeholder for a collection of arguments. So. Uh, um, is the collection of all the instances of a, a given argument. And on that kind of view, if you wanted to talk about adopting or knowing a schema, such as what is Poners, uh, it would be for each, each instance of that schema uh, to recognize that that instance is valid. Um, you can also uh, think of schemas as more, as more like recipes or um, uh, rule-like, if you wish, um, telling you what expressions you are allowed to substitute and how in a, a given uh, pattern. So what you're, how you're allowed to substitute for the schematic uh, letter. So on that kind of view of schemas, adopting or knowing respondents would be uh, uh, knowing that you're allowed to operate certain types of substitutions uh, for the schematic letters. Uh, in more respondents. Okay, so I'm taking 
logical principles to be schemas. And then I want to make the following claim um, that uh, uh, the threats that I've been discussing um, rest on misconstruing the kind of um, transition that are at stake in universal instantiation and the kind of transitions that are at stake when we uh, think about substituting into uh, schemas. Indeed, it's confusing two kinds of generalities uh, that we should uh, keep apart. Um, so let me just uh, uh, flesh this out. So there is a generality of you know, the quantifier in universal instantiation, um, which is, you know, uh, a device that, uh, or an expression that ranges over absolutely everything, okay? So an unrestricted application of universal instantiation goes from about, you know, a claim about all objects whatsoever to a claim about a particular one. So exactly what you have in UI1 uh, uh, on the handout. Um, the generality of schemas is restricted, okay? So the schematic letters are limited to the, you know, uh, countable set of expressions in a given language. So prima facie, two kinds, of two kinds of generalities. If you were, for instance, to, um, no, I'll, I'll leave that, uh, okay. Um, Okay, um, so given this, um, um, I want to, s no, given these differences uh, in generality, I want to say two different things about the kinds of transitions that are at stake in uh, universal instantiation and uh, in uh, substitution within a schema. Okay, so um, I take it that accepting universal instantiation and modus ponens is accepting the validity of each of their respective substitution instances. Now, by definition, a substitution instance has exactly the same logical form as the instance it is an inst as the form it is an instance of, okay? So substituting is just replacing within something that has the same form. Um, and indeed, if you look at uh, UIMP and UI2 on the handout, what's going on there is replacing something with a certain logical form with another thing that has exactly the same logical form. Uh, so that should make us suspect that what's going on is not really, you know, uh, universal, what's going on is not really universal sensation, but um, uh, schematic substitution, okay? By contrast, um, when we think about the generative quantification, uh, we are transiting, uh, you know, when we are genuinely applying universal instantiation, we make a transition between two formulas that have different forms. One has a quantifier at the start and the other uh, has uh, an individual constant. So um, while both represent forms of transitions from the general to the particular, uh, I submit they are different transitions uh, from the general to the particular. One relies on things having the same pattern, the same form. The other relies on, you know, going from a general claim to uh, a particular uh, instance of a different form. Okay. If that's correct, um, then um, UI2 and UIMP, the problematic applications of universal sensation in the uh, circular arguments we've been looking at uh, are just wrongly characterized as applications of universal uh, instantiation. So what's going on in step? <laughs> <laughs> this is my fan club. <laughs> <laughs> or not, I don't know how to, okay. So step three uh, and step seven and step 11 of the three arguments I've offered you, you know, are just, you know, they're just wrongly stated. We're not applying universal instantiation here. Uh, we're doing something else. Okay, let's try, uh, and I want to sort of tell you a bit more about what I think is going on in uh, those steps of those arguments. Um, so what is substitution? Um, I'm thinking of substitution 
or it's standard to think of substitution as a kind of uh, syntactical semantic transition um, and uh, you know whatever rules might be association or you know that tell you what's permitted or what's not permitted um, uh, um, you know uh, are just you know rules that codify certain syntactical semantic uh, uh, replacements um, crucially it doesn't seem that substitution uh, you know, or those kinds of transitions required, um, you know, mastery or application of any kind of logical constant, as would an application of uh, modus ponens or um, um, uh, universal instantiation would. So the way I like to think about substitution as this quasi syntactic uh, this, this uh, this syntactical semantic phenomenon. Okay, and so drawing from that, uh, you might sort of think that um, to recognize uh, an instance of a pattern or instances of a pattern uh, is, you know, basically grounded in a capacity to recognize things that uh, have the same kind of form. So, all right, I need. Is this? Right, so uh, okay, yeah. Right. So, for instance, take a uh, British killed Caesar, Oswald killed Kennedy. Uh, so it is easy to see that these things have the, have the same form, uh, they share a form, um, they are structured in the same way. Um, you can see that, you can recognize that they share a form or a pattern, and that doesn't seem that, you know, that requires you to infer from a general form to the fact that these uh, have, uh, you know, these are instances of that form. It seems that here, uh, the recognition, you know, there are simple enough forms, uh, there are uh, <coughs> clear enough forms. The, the transition is rather, the recognition is rather uh, immediate. And my suggestion is that with simple enough instances of modus ponens, it's pretty much the same story. Um, uh, we can see that, you know, uh, 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 two instances have uh, the same pattern. I'm not saying there is absolutely no process, or I'm, you know, I'm not describing anything. Uh, I'm not insisting that the process has to be immediate, but I'm insisting it's not a logical transition, okay, from a university, you know, uh, quantified claim to a particular case. You know, that there is a bit of, you know, so some people want to talk about general, generality constraints, about, you know, maybe you need to, to um, uh, have a sense that you know other sentences of the same form would uh, uh, that you know be able to predict other cases uh, as having the same form, etc. But it doesn't seem that you know even if you require that, you need to appreciate a bit of generality in order to be able to recognize patterns. It's never going to be as demanding as ap applying universal instantiation. Okay, so if that's the case, then. Uh, you know, it's just not going to be a logical transition that enables us to transition from a part, you know, a general pattern to one of its instances. It's going to be a phenomenon of that uh, sort. Uh, and again, it seems that um, that that would that would mean that you know we might come to you know appreciate that a certain particular inference is an instance of a disponents uh, just by recognizing that they have the same form, that they have the same uh, structure, where that doesn't require us to uh, uh, think of them, of think of us as performing some kind of logical inference. Okay, so if that's the case, again, it seems that we can adopt a principle such as universal instantiation uh, and we might uh, explain why we can adopt such a principle, why, or the way in which it's not the application of a logical principle, by arguing that it rests on some kind of 
pattern recognition, not an application in particular of something like UI2 or UIMP. Uh, okay, so that's my way of addressing the circularity threat uh, offered to uh, the cognitivist. It's not a defense of cognitivism or anything like that, it's just suggesting that uh, uh, <laughs> The argument misidentified the transition that was required uh, in order to go from general principles to the particular instances is not uh, an instance of deductive reasoning. Okay. Uh, how am I doing with time? Uh, you've talked for about 30 minutes. Okay, excellent. So I have a, a bit of time. Um, okay, so now I want to... Um, move to another part of the talk. So, you know, a presupposition in this uh, general to particularity circularity, general to particular circularity threat was that, look, what, what we do when we reason deductively, we start with knowing general rules, which we then apply in reasoning, okay? So that's how um, reasoning was, reasoning is rule following, um, and, uh, um, uh, essentially going from general facts to particular uh, ones. Okay, I want to challenge that view uh, and try to sketch a picture and sketch is important and picture is important because it's not, you know, uh, establishing a claim, it's really sketch a picture where you might sort of um, think that uh, um, Actually, you know, there might be deductive reasoning uh, without uh, appreciation of, you know, logical generality or uh, instantiating from, or, you know, uh, drawing from a, a rule. Okay. So what I want to, th the key claim or picture uh, is that apprehension of general principles such as exponents or universal instantiation um, need, not, need not occur prior to reasoning with their substitution instances, or what I've called the substitution instances, things like um, uh, uh, it is day, if it is day, it is light, therefore it is light. Okay, so um, I'm going to start with sort of some remarks by Priest, uh, which uh, I, I, I think are quite sort of evocative. Um, so um, what he argues is that, you know, uh, in the order of acquisition or justification, we almost never start with uh, the general principles that, you know, all evidence really comes from uh, intuitions about, in, you know, uh, bits, of, uh, bits of arguments in the uh, vernacular, and then, you know, that we generalize from those uh, intuitions we have about uh, inferences in the vernacular to more general views about what inference patterns uh, might be uh, valid. And his reasons for uh, this claim is that, you know, basically all intuitions about particular cases are much more reliable than all intuitions about um, general patterns. It's much easier to see whether a given case was, you know, a, a case of a, a valid argument than to see whether, you know, there's, a, there's no exception whatsoever to uh, a general pattern. I mean, you know, he, Priest is interested in uh, the liar and things like that, so, uh, um, um, which you know you might not foresee if you think of particular cases, but you definitely foresee if you think uh, of non-standard, more difficult cases. Okay, so what he thinks is like, look, we should start with inferences in the vernacular uh, because you know uh, that's generally more reliable, and then we should uh, you know really think of our views about forms of inferences, so general principles such as modus ponens, uh, first as uh, low-level theoretical generalizations. Uh, formed by some kind of induction. So the thought is, look, you know, um, we have a few instances of exponents, they strike us as valid, and we start generalized from, you know, those considerations, and, you know, maybe we uh, form low-level generalizations, we say, oh, okay, maybe inferences of that form are actually valid or good or what have you, um, and then, you know, perhaps uh, we eventually move to a kind of explicit uh, you know, uh, endorsement of a fully uh, uh, general principle that holds for, you know, all the instances. Okay. Um, so, 
I find that picture quite attractive. I mean, obviously, uh, that means that we, insofar as we might come to know general principles such as modus ponens, it would be inductive. Um, so not everybody might like that. Uh, but um, uh, it has some, I mean, I, 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 I'm interested in working with this picture. Notice also that um, even if you're not attracted with this kind of picture, but we were, you were someone like Bonjour, who is interested uh, in articulating uh, basic knowledge of logic in terms of rational insight. Um, Bonjour, and I, you have a quote uh, on the second page of the handout, actually doesn't think that general insight has to operate on general principles. Uh, I'm not going to read it, uh, you, you can uh, read it in your own time. And, and indeed, um, contention, uh, you know, Bogosian's contention that, you know, on Bonjour's picture, rational insight is going to give you access to general uh, logical principles. It's just not at all what <laughs> Bonjour uh, says. Um, uh, he thinks that, you know, insight operates on particular uh, propositions and then, you know, obviously at some point we might generalize on these uh, insights, but uh, uh, um, the view gets off the ground uh, by thinking in terms of instances. Okay, so some, uh, so uh, uh, it doesn't seem that even, you know, if you want to be an <laughs> internalist foundationalist, you have to start with the uh, general principles. Okay, so the picture would go like this. So it would be um, um, a bottom-up picture where you start from the particular and you end up with the general rather than a top-down picture, which is the picture I take. I think it has been discussed where you start with, you know, knowing general principles and you uh, then um, uh, think about the instances uh, later. Um, so suppose that, um, you know, uh, we start with, you know, direct recognition of validity in the particular, so uh, direct intuitions about instances. Um, and then, you know, we really think that, you know, we, you know these are not just byproducts of reasoning uh, with uh, general principles, but that any recognition of uh, generality uh, uh, would be posterior to uh, a recognition of these, uh, the variety of particular instances. And you know, you can imagine that initially we'd, we, we would sort of think of them as uh, low level generalization. So if you have that kind of picture, <laughs> then one advantage would be that it would be relatively unproblematic how untrained thinker might be granted with some competence or proto-knowledge or what have you uh, of basic logical principles without the sophistication of the conceptual sophistication requires required to you know fully grasp uh, things like modus ponens or universal sensation. Um, but also if you don't start with knowledge of general principles uh, then the circularity, circularity thread doesn't even get off the ground, right? Because it's not even clear that there has to be these, you know, bits of knowledge uh, of, uh, 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 of general principle that sit at, you know, uh, that you have to have prior to uh, reasoning in particular instances. Okay, so if we, were, we work with that picture, then there wouldn't even be an issue about adoption as raised by uh, Padho or a current circularity as raised by um, um, Bogosian. That wouldn't even get off the ground. Okay, so, so I like the idea of a bottom-up picture. I like appealing to schemas and um, substitution to understand how we might recognize an instance of modus ponens uh, as a uh, modus ponens or something like that. Now I'd, I'd like to try to sort of com combine the two uh, things to try to give a, a bit of a story about how um, uh, the bottom up picture might work. So let's go back to the original case. So suppose you believe that so you don't know what is or you know you, you, uh, no you don't know universal instantiation. Okay, so suppose you believe that everything is extended, and I ask you whether uh, it's extended. Um, so on this sort of uh, view, well, 
you didn't you wouldn't have to appeal to the Oh, sorry, without my glasses, I can't even read. But, uh, with my glasses, I can't read. But, uh, okay, <laughs> so I'll, I'll be done in two minutes. Uh, okay, so suppose you believe that everything is extended. I ask you, is A extended? Um, and then uh, what I'm, uh, you know, uh, trying to tell you is that you, know, you might have a direct uh, uh, um, Intuition that you know that that's a good uh, inference, uh, or that's a good transition, or uh, uh, that's a valid uh, transition, and uh, without you know having to engage with whether uh, it's, a, it's it's you know an instance of a general uh, pattern. So uh, you could start with that picture, uh, and maybe then if you want to sort of think of what it is to adopt. Uh, universal sensation or no universal sensation, so the general principle. Well, the story would be for that, you know, you, you engage in lower level uh, generalizations across uh, instances. And the story about how that might go would be exactly the story that I've told you when I discussed the schema. The schema is, you know, uh, it would be underpinned by your capacity to recognize, uh, different, you know, instances of the same form as uh, uh, having the uh, same form. So we underpinned by this notion, this idea that you can recognize simple enough uh, patterns. So provided you can have insights into the validity of particular arguments and you have a capacity to uh, recognize things as being structurally the same, then it's no mystery how you can then engage in, you know, uh, uh, generalizing from those cases up to then, uh, if you want, have a full-blown knowledge of uh, logical uh, principles. So uh, you can reconstruct, and so you know what it would, what it is to have knowledge of generality from uh, uh, this picture that that really rests on, you know. Uh, having particular insights into inferences plus a story about uh, pattern recognition. Um, and so um, I think it would be nice to have a picture like that, uh, for, you know, fully, fully developed to, um, as an alternative perhaps to the following, the, to the rule following picture that people discuss, which systematically gets trapped into these problems that, you know, rules are general, and so how does it, how we, you know, really applying these things in reasoning, you know, aren't they just too sophisticated, uh, um, etc. Then if you could get this sort of epistemological story started, then you would have a good, uh, good account of how um, we might gain knowledge of general rules, but also how there might be sort of rather low level, barely competent, or, uh, you know, uh, reasoning with something like a proto rule or an ad hoc or more ad hoc rule. Um, okay, but um, so that's for my desire to have that kind of picture and hoping that something along those lines can be, you know, uh, made tighter. But even if that's not the case, I hope I've convinced you that there is an answer to the uh, particular, uh, the general particular circularity threat that you know, is available to all, uh, uh, whether you're a rule following person or uh, uh, you know, a cognitivist or what have you. Thank you very much.